We're on page 51 in the Kuzari. Um, we're in the middle of the argument of the philosopher. The philosopher has told the King Bulan, the Khazar king, that in response to the dream that he's had, that he needs to seek out the proper path in life, religiously, <laughs> the philosopher tells him um, that really there is something called the prime cause. There is something known as, you can call it a god, you can call it a prime cause, you can call it whatever you like. But this god really has no knowledge of anything that is existing in a temporal universe, in this world that is filled with, um, with uh, changes in time and in space. God is above all that. The prime cause is above all that. God didn't, the prime cause never created anything. <coughs> Everything has eternally existed as the Aristotelian way of describing um, <coughs> eternal existence, which is immutable and unchanging by, by nature of the um, perfection of the being from which everything emanates. Um, now, another, another sort of byproduct of the worldview of the philosopher is that everything in the world is made up of what it's supposed to be made up of, and that uh, there are certain rules of nature that are inviolable. So if you see certain kinds of, um, certain kinds of phenomena that exist either in the, in the human world or the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom, you have to appreciate that whatever exists is basically a rule of nature, and there's nothing that can be altered or changed based on some sentient being's desire to change it. A, because God isn't even aware of what's going on down here, has no desire or will to change anything. And B, the rules that exist within nature are inviolate. They can't be changed. This, everything is the way that it is. And I want you to think about, as we read this next paragraph, um, where there's a greater propensity for hatred of one's fellow human being. You know, over over the his, over history, over the centuries, religion has gotten a bad rap, in my opinion, in that, uh, you know, people have killed in the name of religion. Man has risen up against man, sword has risen up against sword, and sometimes there have been holy wars that have been fought for the sake of my God is more is greater than your God, my religion is greater than your religion, and uh, this has resulted in, in a tremendous amount of bloodshed to the point where people have argued quite convincingly that um, religion is responsible for more bloodshed that, and more evil and more death and more suffering than it is responsible for goodness in the world. I'm sure you've probably heard this argument before, and we would be hard-pressed to find a response to it. However, I think that the way to respond to that is, is that the human condition is that, that which has bred bloodshed and violence, and people have used the basic human nature, the, what we would call the Yetzir Hara, within the human being, and have masked it with religion in order to justify uh, ex acting upon their Yetzir Hara. That would be, of course, the way that we, we would respond. There have been plenty of people, right, even the devil can quote scripture, as the saying goes. There have been plenty of people who have had malicious intent and have a, had a desire to do something destructive and evil in the world and have been able to justify their malicious uh, desires by covering it over with the defense of religion. That doesn't mean that religion, by definition, by definition inherently breeds this. It's just the opposite, that the human nature is what breeds malice and what breeds evil, but it's, uh, it's that people can justify their malice through you covering it up with, uh, well, that my religion says that I'm supposed to do this. Um, and I want you to think about that as we go through the argument of the philosopher. Some have argued that the philosopher's way of life is beautiful because, after all, his, his attitude is, I don't care what you do with your life. It's your life. Do whatever with it, whatever you want. But you should know that the purpose of life is to acquire perfected knowledge and perfected intellect. That's your, that's your purpose in life. And whatever you do with your life, it's, uh, it's up to you. Um, you know, you want to live like a philosopher, that's your business. You want to live like a Christian, that's your business. I don't care. It's not my, one, my life's goal is not to convert you to my way of life, says the philosopher. Uh, however, if you're seeking perfection, 
the way that you should go about it is perfecting your mind, is perfecting your intellect until you can achieve perfection and con what we'll learn about is today called something called conjunction, unification with, with uh, some manifestation of God in this world, which has to do with perfected intellect. Now, um, the reason I raise this is because um, I think that that argument that religion is the cause of all the world's evils was, uh, you, could, you could make that argument until the advent of Nazi Germany. With the advent of Nazi Germany, we find that a completely, um, or to, the, to a large extent, a secular uh, society uh, <laughs> rises up using science, at, using eugenic principles, you know, principles of uh, genetics and racial inferiority as the basis for committing genocide and wiping out an entire uh, group of, or, uh, an ethnic group or ethnic groups, not only Jews but gypsies and others as well who were viewed as inferior. And I want you to keep that in mind when we read this paragraph because this is not a new phenomenon. As you'll see, I think this has existed ever since the times of the ancient philosophers as well, in that the view of the philosopher seems to be that because everything is set in stone, you are what you are based upon how you're born and what your genetic makeup is going to be. And so the fact of the matter is, is that some people simply are inferior to others. And once we know that some people are inferior to others, we can certainly justify creating a, a caste or a class system, and even perhaps even justifying that some people are more human and some people are less human. You know, uh, invoke the memory of Animal Farm. Okay, so let's take a look on page 51. We need a reader for today. Any volunteers? Volunteers, volunteers. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All worldly phenomena can loud, very, very, very loud, if you don't mind. All worldly phenomena can ultimately be traced back to the prime cause. So we're up, yeah, we're up to page 51 now, paragraph 12. Oh, 12, sorry. Yes, no problem. Every order of creation has a different makeup, depending upon the creation's uh, innate elements and its environment. Within each order, we find discrepancies in the wholeness of each object. Some will have reached what would be considered perfection for that species, while others will remain with deficiency. You know that uh, this was Plato's big thing. He said that um, the, the physical world is all about preserving the forms, uh, <coughs> preserving the, the optimal shape and way things should be. You can never get an optimal um, form of anything in the physical world. But what you try to look for is the closest to perfection that you can obtain in this world. And one should gravitate towards those physical phenomena in this world that are closest to the uh, elusive perfection. So everything in this world that is physical is made up by, its, by virtue is going to have discrepancies and wholeness. And some will have reached what be, can be considered to be perfection to, that, to the extent that it's possible in this world and others will remain with deficiencies. Continue. The deficient human, for example, would be the Kushite, who is completely human, yet has only the bare essentials of humanity. He has a human force and knows how to pronounce words, but is not prone to wisdom. The philosopher, on the other hand, is imbued with inherent abilities that give rise to a refined personality, wisdom, and good deeds. He lacks nothing in his humanity. Now, those words are pretty scary, because when you think about them, and you think, think, think about <laughs> the Aryan uh, race, the Aryan, Aryan racial superiority, and saying this about uh, thinking, and instead of the word Kushite, put in the word Jew or put in the word Negro. Um, and you, you come up with something that uh, sounds quite contemporary in the sense that this is a very eugenic um, attitude that the philosophers had, that while the objective of life is for every human being to reach perfected intellect, to perfect your mind, we also have to acknowledge that there are certain people who come into this world because of their racial uh, makeup simply lack the ability to reach the perfected intellect that is the goal for every philosopher. So philosophers, fortunately, the, the, the world of the philosopher is a group that comes from uh, Athens or Greece or migrates over to the Arabian Peninsula and is able to reach perfection because we were born with certain innate qualities and talents that en enable us to reach perfected intellect. But unfortunately, there are certain human beings who are just barely human. 
and therefore they can't even reach this level of perfected intellect. They will never be philosophers because of their racial, racial inferiority. Now, I'm glossing over what a Kushite is, because a Kushite is, um, in rabbinic literature, is a person who is a Negro. So it's a, what we would call someone who's black today. But I'm using the racial terminology because this is a racially infused paragraph. In other words, it's someone who has the racial um, um, uh, features of someone who comes from Africa, who has dark skin. Chazal themselves talk about a certain type of innate uh, um, inferiority that sometimes exists within the Kushite. And Chazal themselves were influenced by the worldview that they lived in. And I think this is one example. It's not something that I would necessarily say that we should be extolling that. And, and I, I do get upset sometimes when I hear about, when I hear racial slurs coming from the, especially from the Orthodox Jewish community. I think that's extremely unfortunate because, number one, we know what persecution feels like. And so we're the last people, kind of people who should be making ethnic or racial slurs. But also because we have to consider that it was the eugenic experiment of Nazi Germany that wiped out six million of our people. <clears throat> and so for us to be making eugenic judgments based upon the color of a person's skin is sort of to align ourselves with this kind of ideology, which is really just the, the medieval version of Nazi Germany. Um, and so one of the things that we need to appreciate is that while Chazal themselves had the understanding that there are certain innate qualities to every race and to every nation. And they even pointed out that God cursed Canaan, and Canaan, the son of Ham, is the father of the Negro people. But nevertheless, and even, the, and even if there are certain characteristics that even today may reflect a certain disadvantage because of that original curse that Noah gave to Ham and to Canaan, but to suggest that because of that, every person who has black skin is innately inferior would be to subscribe to this, and that's a mistake. The one difference that exists between the philosopher and the Jew in this, in this kind of argument is, sure, there are racial characteristics to every nation, to every ethnicity. And therefore, a, a certain a person's racial disposition may make them prone to one thing over another thing. But that doesn't mean that a person is locked into that and doesn't have its Selim Elohim. We are, uh, the, the one thing that is the defining difference between our attitude and this attitude is that we all, we all have its Selim Elohim within us, we all have an Neshama within us, which is metaphysical, it's supernatural. And therefore it far transcends uh, any kind of physical confinement that we may find ourselves with. And furthermore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in charge of every single individual human being. We believe in Ashkacha Pratit, we believe in divine providence over every single individual. So God could take the holiest of neshamas and put it into a Kushite body, and that person could become the greatest tzaddik of the generation. So we have to appreciate that. Yes, there are certain racial and, and ethnic characteristics to every, that every person fits into, right? And whether those, whether those characteristics would be viewed in a, objectively as positive or negative, does not necessarily affect the individual that is standing in front of us in question. It's interesting because, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu is criticized in the Torah uh, by Miriam and her brother Aharon, Moshe's two siblings. Why? Why was Moshe? Why were they speaking lashon hara about Moshe? Al ha'isha hakushit asher lakach ki isha kushit lakach because he married a kushite woman. Now, many of you may be familiar with the famous Rashi that says that it was really a reference to Tzipora. And was Tzipora truly a Kushite? Of course not. She was a Midianite, and the Kushites come from Canaan, and the Midianites come from uh, Moab and, and Midian. They, they come from they come from Lot and uh, they come from Avraham's family. They are they're a diff completely different uh, racial uh, racial ethnicity. And so, therefore, uh, the Chazal themselves explained that. Sipora was as righteous, distinctively righteous, as a Kushite skin is distinctively dark. And that, of course, is the way that Chazal poetically explain what is going on in the story. But many other Rishonim do not explain it that way. They explain, no, Moshe Rabbeinu married a black woman. And the Medrash even states 
that he had been a ruler in Africa for many years, from the time that he was exiled from Egypt to the time that he found himself in Yisro's home in Midian. And he had married the, the, queen, of, uh, the queen of Africa uh, for a certain period of time. So w what the criticism of them was, Ibn Ezra explains quite fascinatingly, is that Moshe Rabbeinu at one point uh, divorced himself, separated himself from his Kushite wife, and they thought it was because he no longer found her attractive because Kushites uh, in that, in that uh, social setting were, no long, were not found to be attractive. That's what the Ibn Ezra writes. And they were critical of him and they said, Moshe Rabbeinu would have such petty concerns as attractiveness. That's not, uh, that's not befitting a Moshe Rabbeinu. What they failed to understand was, this Ibn Ezra says this, what they failed to understand was that um, he divorced his wife because he needed to be in a constant state of kedusha and purity in order to be able to have nevuah, in order to be able to have prophecy. Right? So, uh, so that's what the Ibn Ezra says. But, he, the, he, by, but, but the point that we're, I believe that we're supposed to be taking from this is that, think about what the Ibn Ezra is saying, that the criticism of Moshe Rabbeinu, were it true, would be extremely valid. We don't look at the, per the color of a person's skin or their ethnicity in the way the philosopher does. Uh, the philosopher's attitude is because everything is set in stone in nature, you are what you were born to be. And there are no other considerations other than your racial and physical makeup. That's it. You're stuck. And if you're going to be, if you're born to a certain race, you have intellectual inferiorities that don't allow you to reach, your, reach a perfected humanity because you're, you're only barely human. <coughs> Judaism never subscribes to that because Chaviva Adam Shanivra B'Tselem. How beloved is every single human being who was created in the image of God. So I want you to consider that next time someone tells you that religion is the source of all violence <coughs> and malice between man and his fellow human being. It's really just the other way around. Religion is used as a foil for those who have malice in their hearts. But religion, just to the contrary, especially the, Jew the Jewish faith, believes that every person is created in the image of God. And if someone were to truly be religious, they wouldn't have these kinds of attitudes. Let's go on, because I want to get to something very important today, which is the active intellect. Um, so, yes, please, if you wouldn't mind, uh, any, anyone want to, uh, is anyone bothered by any of this? Because I would hope someone would be bothered by something. Uh, yes? I'm not sure that every religion, I, I agree with that. I'm concerned about it. I can't remember what it is, but I know that in India there is currently still taxes I'm not sure if it's a, a cultural thing or a religious thing. And there are other religions that shall remain, let's say, nameless. But if we're talking about Judeo-Christian, maybe it's one thing. I'm a little concerned about certain other ones that have built in, seem to have built in hatred. Yeah, I think Christianity has built in hatred, too. Uh, religions, Christianity and Islam do have built in hatred because they, they needed to prove that they were right and Judaism was wrong. Anytime someone's intimidated by someone who he knows deep down is really right, they have to point the finger at the one that's really right and really true and say that they're the bad guy. Uh, so I agree with you that uh, that is the unfortunate, distorted part of Christianity and Islam. But those who choose to focus on those, you know, Islam is going through an iteration, and uh, this, of course, is the controversial part that I'm going to be raising right now. Islam right now is going through an iteration that Christianity went through in the Middle Ages, which is to hate the other and to force and to and to believe in forced conversion, and that the only way that the world can be can realize its true uh, greatness is through either killing or converting everyone else in the world to its to to its brand of godliness to to Islam. Christianity went through that phase as well, um, and again, that's the example of using religion as a foil. Really, there was, a, there was a desire for world domination because of an innate hunger that exists within the human being to swallow everyone else up and to take over everyone else. That's part of our Tzalem Elohim, by the way, which is to have this creative energy and creative force which can be, can be turned into something very destructive. So that's what Islam is going through now. Um, I think that if you look through the texts of the Quran and compare it in, to, vari to various passages of the New Testament, I don't think that you'll find that the Quran is any more of a violent or hateful piece of literature than the New Testament is. 
it just so happens that uh, there are people who, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Islamic world today, who have chosen to focus on violence. But believe it or not, there have been more periods in history where Jews have had it better under Islamic rule than under Christian rule than the other way around. Yes? And so we're going through an unfortunate period of time right now where the Muslims are a little bit mashuga. But that doesn't mean that, that, doesn't mean that uh, I shouldn't say a little bit mashuga. There are many very, very mashuga uh, people there out there. But that doesn't mean that, I, that Islam is necessarily any more inherently destructive or violent or hateful than Christianity is. They both have that kernel of hatred of the other, which was bred from their, their insecure need to assert themselves as the one truth. Am I making sense? You follow me? Uh, I mean, I, you may, you're free to disagree, but I, I think if you look at the broader stroke of history, you'll discover this to be the case. Yeah. Well, Hashem never told us to, uh, Hashem told us, I gave you Eretz Israel. The land of Israel is yours. The rest of the world is a big neighborhood and it belongs to the rest of the nations. And not only that, but if the nations want to live in the land of Israel, they're more than welcome to. They just have to commit themselves to Shiva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach, to the seven Noachide laws, and they're more than welcome to stay. Yes? So it's those who refuse who have to be driven from the land. Except for Amalek, who we are taught to hate. Except for Amalek, who we are taught to hate. That is correct. Yeah. So, um, and Amalek is a relatively small uh, percentage of, uh, of the world, of the human, very, very small, a minuscule percentage of the world. Doesn't even, we can't even identify Amalek anymore. But the point is that if, the, if Muslims were to say, Saudi Arabia is ours, the rest of the world belongs to the rest of humanity, I don't have a problem. You can have the desert. <laughs> we don't need it. We're not using it. Uh, oil would be nice, but uh, <laughs> we found some other stuff just off the coast of Israel, so uh, we'll, we'll be able to be okay. Um, and if the Christians were to say Rome or Italy is ours and the rest of the world is fine, that's one thing. But the, the, um, the Jewish faith has never had as part, of its, um, as part of its mission statement to convert the entire world to Judaism. And that's something that Rabbi Huda Halevi is going to emphasize very, very strongly. Uh, the Khazar king, in, in trying to compare all of the world religions, is working under a false impression of that Judaism has the same mission statement as Christianity and Islam. That either everyone has to be a Christian, or everyone has to be a Muslim, or everyone has to be a Jew. Yeah. And Rabbi Huda Levi quickly dispels that myth, and he says, no, what are you talking about? If the, if the mission statement of Judaism was that everyone had to be a Jew, then why did God choose to give us the Torah in our unique language all the way out in the desert where no one else was around? The very fact that Hashem gave it to us on Har Sinai, away from the rest of the world, and he gave it to us specifically in our language, and he gave it specifically to us, addressing us specifically as the Jewish people. It means he's, it's lo me It's not because you're the most multitudinous of nations that God chose you. God wants to keep the Jews, Jewish people, a small percentage of mankind. And one of the things that we're going to have to analyze is why is it that if Judaism is the one truth in the world for how a person is supposed to live his or her life, then why would God want to keep that? Um, um, sort of confined to one group of people over the, and over the rest of the world. Why wouldn't Hashem want the whole world to be Jewish? Well, of course, one reason is because then no one would buy retail, right? <laughs> that's, you know, that's as the old joke goes, right? Um, but there's got to be, but there's got to be another reason. We have to understand why Hashem is happy that there's only one small group of people in the world, 0.01 percent of humanity, that possesses the truth of the Torah. And why the rest of the world is, is welcome to just do its own thing, is just do seven Noahide laws and you're fine. Yeah? What about the concept of being or la goyim, where we are supposed to show the beauty of Judaism? Sure, we are supposed but, to but show But that's it. not supposed to convince people to change religion? Like, is no, it's supposed to convince people to be moral and ethical and monotheistic okay. and to subscribe to the seven Noahide laws. That's what our role is. We're not, the Gemara does suggest that the, when Hashem put us in the Galut, that he did so with the, with the objective of not only making us an Orla Goyim, but also making us further 
a, a, the, the springboard to allow people to convert to Judaism. But that doesn't seem to be the primary mission statement of the Jewish people. That's not what, that's not what we're here in Toronto for. We're here, to make, we're here to show people what God wants of the world, but not to make people into Jews. Yes? Maybe we just find ourselves, Hashem found himself in a situation that is a plan A, plan D of Jewish people. Plan A was Adam and Hava. Plan B was, you know, Noah. So God sort of had to settle for us, you know. <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's just, that's exactly, no, but, these, but you see, but that the Torah says precisely not that way. The Torah says that Ki Atem Hamat, God specifically wants us to be the smallest of all nations. That's the optimal, and we'll learn about that. We're, we're running ahead of ourselves, so let's, yes. We, and we have been. We've been like the stars of the sky. And w w so when you look at the 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 the, the, um, the larger frame of human history, who's been along the, who's been around the longest? He didn't say that we're going to be like the sands of the sea all necessarily at one time, but that we're going to be over the course of history, over human history. We have been the most the most multitudinous nation because we've been around the longest, and we've had the most impact, the most influence on the world of any other nation. So we are like the sand of the sea, or the sand of the beach, and like the stars of the sky. Okay, so let's let's go on. Uh, paragraph 13, please. The abilities within the individual, the individual are only potential abilities. They can only be realized through study and training. Once this is accomplished, the individual's capability, depending upon what qualities and deficiencies the individual is inherently meant to have, are realized. The different levels within humanity are endless. So the philosopher does acknowledge that it's not automatic that you're going to be acquiring perfected intellect just because you were born genetically with certain innate qualities. Once you're born with certain uh, qualities, they only exist in potentio. You have to be able to realize them by working on it. So the philosopher does acknowledge that life takes work. To achieve perfection, it takes work, but still, notwithstanding, we still have paragraph 12 for the philosopher. You are what you're born with. You're born with certain limitations, even potential, even intellectual perfection uh, limitations. So not everyone's going to be zoicha, not everyone's going to merit to become this perfected <laughs> human being, because if, if perfection is defined by your intellectual perfection, then certain people who have limited humanity have limited intellectual capabilities, and therefore they will never reach perfection. But if you were born into the world of philosophy, meaning that you have the right pedigree, you're, you're racially, you're okay, then, then it's up to you now to realize your potential. You have to work on that by developing your intellect. And now let's talk, now let's go to paragraph 14, and we're just going to read the first sentence. So we're on page 52, top of uh, the top of the page. One who is complete is affected by a divine light, which is called the active intellect. Okay, good enough. Now we'll talk more about the active intellect next week, but I wanted to define what the active intellect is for you now. If you want to know more about the active intellect, it's known as the Seichel HaPoel in Hebrew, then I encourage you to read Appendix A, which is called the, uh, an essay on, a short essay on Greek philosophy. It's on page 597 in the back of your book. And one of the sections over there makes an attempt to define what the active intellect is on page 606. And that, that if appendix, there's a short discussion of the active intellect. But um, the active intellect is a very strange topic. Um, but it's a vast topic. Because as foreign as the, the topic, as foreign, foreign as the concept sounds to us today, it was accepted science in Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's world. So let me just explain briefly what the active intellect is, and then we'll see how it applies to Judaism. Philosophers believed in the medieval period, especially in the Arabic world, and the people who promoted this the most were the philosophers by the name of Al-Farabi, Avicenna, and Averroes. Those were the three who sort of promoted this the most. These were, Ara these were Islamic philosophers from the Arabic or Persian world. And they believed, building upon certain ideas that were stated by Aristotle, that the way for a human being to achieve perfection is by connecting himself intellectually with the 
most accessible emanation that comes from God. What I mean by the most accessible is because, as we've defined before, God is completely removed from this world. And yet God is somehow connected to this world through a series of emanations that were sort of um, spawned by God's essence. And the way that you would think about it is if a person is radioactive, so they can sort of radiate a certain um, sphere of radiation all around them. And then, depending upon how far you are away from them, the radioactive um, uh, wave becomes weaker and weaker and weaker. So God is here, and the, the sphere that is most, or the circle that is most, that he radiates, that is most connected or closest to him, is most similar to him in some way. And as the radiation goes further and further away from God and it comes closer and closer to our world, then the emanation that we are privy to of God is least similar to him, but is the, the only way that man can have access in some way to, to divinity. Okay? And so the objective for man is to connect himself to that lowest of emanations of God, which is the only emanation that is access accessible to man. And every emanation, every one of these radioactive waves that I've mentioned to you, has what's called an intelligence or a sentience. And the human being's objective is that his own mind should be raised to a level of perfection through certain ideas that he develops within his or her mind, to the point where those ideas are able to conjoin, to connect, to the intelligence of this lowest emanation of God. And when, when my thoughts can conjoin with the thoughts of this lowest emanation, then even when I die, I live on eternally, because my thoughts have connected to the ether, and the ether is eternal. It's a very bizarre theory, right? What I just told you, yes? But that's accepted science in the 12th century. So the only way for a person to gain immortality is through developing their intellect. Now, there are many who have argued that the Rambam subscribed to this idea. And that's a, that's a discussion for another time. What we are learning is a presentation of the active intellect as presented by, a, by the philosopher, the unnamed philosopher in the Kuzari, who is someone who Rabbi Yehuda Halevi does not agree with. He thinks does not have the truth. But does that mean that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi completely rejects the concept of the active intellect? And does that mean that the world of Judaism has no appreciation for the topic of the active intellect? Well, what if I were to tell you that the active intellect, which is the, what we call the Seichel HaPo'el, the reason why it's called active is because there was a belief that if I develop my intellect enough, then this nebulous intelligence from on high can actually give me my eureka moments. In other words, the, the, my moments of inspiration in life come when I really develop and work hard on developing my thoughts, and then all of a sudden I have a burst of inspiration, I have an epiphany, that epiphany comes as a gift from the active intellect who recognizes that I'm working hard, this angel, who recognizes that I'm working very, very hard and diligently to try and perfect myself and conjoin to perfect intelligence. And as a result, it gives me like this boom. It sort of gives me this, this gush of knowledge. And that's why I feel that sense of eureka, the light bulb going off in, on my head. Now, lest you think that this is completely outside the pale of Judaism, let's take a look at this week's Parsha. And that's why, unlike other Shi'urim, where we sort of have our Kuzari half and our Parsha half, this week is completely, uh, they really run seamlessly into the other. And I am, again, I've have I done, I've done something foolish once again, and that I have not saved the handout for myself. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. The Gid HaNasheh and the active intellect. So, what in the world do they share in common? 
Now, we know that the story of the Gid HaNashem, this is the wrestling match that Yaakov Avinu has, and by the way, if the, if the topic of the active intellect of the Seichel HaPoel is a little bit uh, strange and nebulous still, don't worry, it took me about three years to figure it out. Um, so I'll, I'll revisit it next week. We'll talk about it a little bit more next week. My reason for introducing it to you is just really, we need to at least just get through this passage, understand what it is, but also to appreciate that because it was the science of its time, it was incorporated into mainstream Jewish thought by an entire world of Jewish thinkers. And you have to, in some way, integrate it with your understanding of what the Torah expects of every single Jew. <laughs> Rabbeinu Bechaya, who lives in, the, lives in the 13th century, is a Talmud of the Rashba, he's a Talmud of the Ramban, and he is one of the truly, truly great and classic Torah commentaries. I don't have to tell you. You've probably studied him at one time in your life. And the Rabbeinu Bechaya's method of Torah commentary is to sometimes pick a little bit from column A, pick a little bit from column B, meaning that sometimes he'll present the rational approach, sometimes he'll present the mystical approach, sometimes he'll, uh, he'll present the homiletical approach. Rabbeinu Bechaya will, will, will choose which he feels is most appropriate for which passage and which story in Tanakh. And it just so happens that Rabbeinu Bechaya chose for the story of the wrestling match that Yaakov has with the angel, with this Vayayavek Ish Imo, that a man wrestled with him, he chooses the <coughs> philosophical path as a way of presenting the story. Now, you and I, because of our upbringing, have always understood that this story of the wrestling match is Yaakov wrestling with what? Ace of Angel. Yes, Ace of Angel. But that's only one out of a very broad spectrum of different understandings of what the story is all about. So I'd like to introduce you to Rabbeinu Bechaya's approach, which is really not his. He acknowledges that it's not his. It's from one of the great Jewish philosophers of the city of Seville, right? And who, which was a very philosophical place. Jews were studying a lot of philosophy. It's part of the Al-Andalus. It's part of the Andalusian revolution within Judaism, this very, uh, very enlightened and philosophical world of, of uh, the world of medieval Spanish Jewry. And so, uh, let's take a look uh, at what Rabbeinu Bechayah says. And we'll just read a few lines together. He says, Using the philosophical approach, Rabbeinu Bechayah says, or the intellectual approach, he says as follows. That a man wrestled with him, Ze Gabriel. This refers to the angel Gabriel. Vehus HaSeichel Poel Ledaat Chachmei HaMechkar. This refers to the Seichel HaPoel, the active intellect, or as the Muslims knew it, and they were the ones who actually created the term, al-Akal al-Fa'al, which is what we, all we do is we just translate that into Hebrew and we call it the Seichel HaPoel. It does not originate with Judaism. It originates with Islamic philosophy. And we have indoctrinated it and incorporated it within Jewish thought. So Rabbeinu Bechayi says, this is the Seichel HaPo'el Ladat Chachmei HaMechkar according to the philosophical world. V'hu ha-ma'ala ha-asirit mi-ma'alot ha-malachim ha-nikra'im ishim. And this represents the tenth level of levels of emanations of angels that emanate from God, who are also known as fires. V'alkein nikra bakatuv ish. And that's why ishim could be fires, it could be, it could be men, However, you're going to translate it, but that's why the Torah calls it a niche. It's one of these angelic emanations of these, these radioactive spheres that I talked to you about before. The Yaakov Ratzaleda, im efshar shetihiyeh nafsho sichlit ba'odam meshutefet bechomer. Yaakov simply wanted to know one basic philosophical question: Is it possible for a human being, while confined in his physical visage, to be able to achieve perfected intellect? And the Madrigat HaSeichel HaPol Hanaki HaTohor Min HaChomer. To the same degree as the active intellect, there were the angel Gabriel, who was completely divested of any physicality. Can a human being, confined in the physical world, achieve perfect intellectual knowledge? Or is it that by virtue of my physicality, I am limited in my ability to achieve perfection? Now, if we were to frame this, 
in a non-philosophical way, it would still fit in beautifully to a Jewish theme which we can all relate to, which is Yaakov was wrestling with himself. Yaakov recognizes, I have a Yetzir Hara. I have a physical nature to me. Is it possible for a human being to achieve spiritual perfection while still confined within a physical body? Is it possible to, in, in, for an individual to surpass that which Shlomo HaMelech says in Koheles, ki ish ein, or ki adam ein ba'aretz asher ya'as eto velo yacheta? That is, there is no such thing as a human being living in this world who can do good and do no evil. And Shlomo HaMelech was acknowledging in that verse that by virtue of a person's physical essence, it is impossible to acquire perfection. But that's was, is, this is precisely what Yaakov Avinu was trying to determine for himself. How far can I go? Can I achieve perfection as a disembodied angel? Or will I always remain substandard to the angelic realm by virtue of my physicality? Now, if we were to phrase it in that way, no problem. There's nothing foreign about this idea. But understand that when we're dealing with the philosophical world of the Jewish philosopher, we phrase everything in terms of perfected intellect, not in terms of perfected spirituality. That's the only difference here. And I just want you to be mindful of that as we continue with the foreign terminology that we're, that we're encountering right now. And so we continue and it says, um, the ho di o. And so the angel informs Yaakov, ki i efshar lo ze ad alos hashachar, that it is impossible for him to reach the state of perfected disembodied intellect until the dawn. Kolomar ad shi ispalek mi machashakei haguf, that is until Yaakov is able to divest himself of the darkness of the of the physical of the body. El haor hatzach vehatohor shekinehu bishachar. And until, and until that such time when he emerges divested of his body into a pure and clear light, which is, a, which is called by the Torah the dawn. The dawn represents the disembodied human being who is divested of this, of this physical visage that pulls him down, this very platonic view that the soul and the body are constantly at odds with each other. And the body is the thing that pulls me away from my ability to achieve perfection. And what the angel was basically telling Yaakov, you'll never be able to become perfect as long as you're still within the murkiness of your body. And once you're able to escape your body, then you'll achieve perfection. And he continues along <clears throat> this, entire, this entire commentary, which we're not going to have time to go into today, continues along this sequence along this this way of thinking <clears throat> and if you want to get down to the bottom of the page let's just go down to the bottom where um, and by the way why does the angel touch his sciatic nerve the gid because the gid which is closest to the reproductive organs is representative of that base physicality that it makes the human being so unable to achieve that perfection Right, the, the sexual urges of every human being, which is represented by the Gid Hanasheh, is sort of like the, the, is sort of, uh, the paradigmatic of this law within humanity that makes it impossible to achieve perfection. Okay, so then comes along at the bottom paragraph, and he says, Hagid Hanashemecha. So finally, Yaakov is able to wrestle the angel until the dawn, and is able to subdue the, the, the angel and are sort of able to overpower him and say, yes, but I still have the ability to in some way achieve some level of perfection. And finally, he says to the angel, before you leave, tell me your name. <coughs> okay, and Ratzaleida Amito Atzmo Shio Ehu Shem Shiore Al Mahuto. That what Yaakov was really trying to understand was a greater sense of innateness within this active intellect. Tell me what your name is. Tell me what your essence is. Ve'eich ha-muskalot mushpaot aleinu me'ito. And how all and how the world of ideas and how intellectual concepts are influenced by your influence, you, the active intellect, you, the angel Gabriel. By the way, who uh, studied with Muhammad in the cave? Uh, who studied with Muhammad in the cave? Come on, all you Muslim scholars. Who studied with Muhammad in the cave? The angel Gabriel. 
we seeing a little bit more uh, intersection here? Okay. Velo rak and the angel says, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to give you the answer as far as uh, what my uh, what my uh, sp uh, span of influence is into this world, but rather Why are you asking for my name? Kilomar, that is to say. Lo You don't need this question. Because you've already achieved tremendously. Or hasichlim, and you've already elevated yourself to the level of disembodied intellect, to the level, to the greatest level possible, so long as you're still embodied. The Omar Acharkach, and then the Torah then tells us, Al Kain Lo Yochelu B'nei Yisrael is Gid Anosha. This is the reason why Jews do not eat the sciatic nerve, Pirusho, and that is to say. Because the intellectual soul, it is only befitting for a soul to be drawn after the active intellect and to aspire to conjunction and connection to the active intellect. It is therefore, it is not becoming. <coughs> of great Jewish people who are want who wish to be wise to pursue physical interests. And the physical interests of life are represented by the Gid Anosha. And that's why to this day we don't eat the hind quarter of the animal, because we should all strive to conjoin with the activity. Now, if someone were to tell you why do we don't eat the Gid Anosha, so it has to do with the Gates of Har, it has to do with Asav, it has to do with right? And here, of course, we are, provide, we are presented with this highly stylized and polished philosophical presentation that it all has to do with the way to achieve intellectual perfection is to push, is to reject the physical aspect of yourself in this world and to try to divest yourself of physicality to the greatest degree possible, greatest degree possible so that you'll conjoin ultimately with, ultimately with the active intellect. So that's sort of what I wanted to... Um, I wanted to try and, um, and and represent, but even if you're not going to understand this as the way that Rabbeinu Bechaya presents it, I want us to get out two things. Number one, the concept of the Seichel HaPoel in the world of, of philosophy is very much part of the Jewish worldview and mindset that is taking place in the 12th century. So we have to be mindful that when Rabbi, when Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi is about to reject the philosopher, he's doing something extremely bold, that even many of his contemporaries might feel that he's wrong in doing so because he's throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's number one. But number two, also appreciate that there are many ways to transfer this, these ideas of the active intellect to a certain kind of terminology that is easier for us to appreciate. So. The, the point that I want you to take out of the story of Esav and the, uh, I mean, uh, Yaakov and the wrestling match is that instead of it representing the external enemy, which is the way that it's presented to us by Rashi's version of the Medrash, that this angel represents, like the Ramban says, it represents this external enemy of persecution and torture that the Jewish people have to face in every generation. And the touching of the sciatic nerve represents for Chazal the idea that, that even though Yaakov remained intact, but future generations of Jewish people would have to go through various, very tragic iterations of persecution and genocide and pogrom and so forth. There's another way of looking at it, that it's a very, very personal wrestling match. It's a wrestling match with oneself. That within me I have a Yetzer Hara, which is pulling me away for the, with, from the true purpose of life. And that's represented by an angel, but not an angel that is my enemy, an angel that is prodding me to realize my potential. That Yaakov is wrestling with the angel because he is trying to aspire to be the angel. And we, in our wrestling with our life, there is an ideal self that we all know exists. There's the real me. There's the, there's the ideal me that exists somewhere inside of me. And I haven't yet been able to realize it. And I know that there's a possibility one day for me to achieve almost perfection. <laughs> and I'm, I've got to constantly wrestle with myself and not eat the Gid Hanasha, not eat the sciatic nerve, which represents all those times during the day when I know that I could be doing better. 
and I and I just succumb to that daily grind of the Yetzir Hara that's pulling me down. And so instead of letting another day go by, when we haven't stri striven for greatness, the story of the wrestling match with Yaakov is, take, take, seize the opportunity and take advantage of the real you that is waiting to emerge inside of you. Reach that level of the angelic you that Yaakov Avinu was wrestling with and, uh, and try to attain it every single day.